What's going on everybody? Today we're going to be reviewing the game Curse of the Idol. This game came out in 1990 from Milton Bradley and it is for two to four players. Now Curse of the Idol is one of Milton Bradley's adventure games and the object of this game is you're going to be trying to become the first player to get out with the bloodstone to your base camp. So let's show you Curse of the Idol. Okay everybody, let's go ahead and get started. We will start with the game board. Uh, there's three different sections in this. There's the uh, base camp area, which is right over here, and this is the base camp space. Um, you have the outer part of the temple right over here, and then you have the inner temple where the idol is. Uh, now, the, what you're going to be trying to do is you're going to be tr trying to become the player that ends up successfully taking the bloodstone back to base camp, and the bloodstone is going to be into that idol over there. Uh, so what you're going to do uh, in the beginning, before you start, you're going to just take the idol over here, and then you're going to go ahead and place uh, the bloodstone into his mouth, shake it up a little bit, and carefully stand it up here on the base, and there you go. Now you're going to choose an adventurer over here, and uh, they're just pretty cool little adventurers. And um, you got a die over here that you're going to be rolling, and uh, this is roll and move mainly, and uh, whatever number you roll, you're going to roll. If you roll sixes, you'll be able to roll again. Uh, now, this, there are certain spaces that will have instructions on them, and you will just simply follow them if you land on them. For example, this one says, discover secret jungle trail, advance two spaces. Right over here is the villain, and when you're rolling the die, you'll be able to choose whether you want to move the villain or uh, one of your player pieces, and I'll talk a little bit about the villain in a little bit. Uh, now, right over here, you have the Golden Sword. Now, whoever possesses the Golden Sword is going to be able to go into the Inner Temple here and uh, try to get the Bloodstone. And the way you're going to be able to get the Bloodstone is you're simply going to just pick a slot uh, to stick the sword in, and if the Bloodstone falls out, then you're going to be able to try to escape with it. And if not, you're going to be uh, sent into what is called the Pit of Bones. And again, I'll talk about all that here in a little bit. So movement rules on this game, you're going to be moving the full amount of the die unless you hit a dead end. Uh, the same goes with the villain, you're not going to be able to double back. Now the villain is mainly going to be used to block players and allow players to steal things. So if you happen to have a player over here, I rolled a six, I would not be able to move past the villain because he is blocking me. Uh, now I'll be able to pass over other players and I'll be able to land on a space uh, with another player, but there can only be two players maximum on a space together. Uh, if a third player were to get here by exact count, he would just have to move back one. Now we have a cute little uh, mechanism over here. This is kind of the wheels of death. Uh, but anytime you land on a gear over here, you're going to go ahead and turn this wheel um, a full rotation and you just simply will follow this little door over here. Uh, now you're not going to be able to get onto this space unless you are on a space that will connect. Anybody can go on here. You don't have to have the sword in order to get onto these spaces. So let's just say I happen to have the sword and I landed over here by the door. I will be able to go ahead and turn this around like this. Now the rules say that you're going to have to stay on that space until your next turn. Uh, but what tends to happen is, is like another player could land on here and then this can happen. And this can actually happen several times in the game. It can get a little bit repetitive. So a house rule that I have seen and I implement this is that I will just simply move uh, the person off onto the next space over there like so. Now once you're actually in uh, this area over here, and again, you need to have the sword, you will be able to uh, try to get the bloodstone out with the sword. Uh, now, you'll get one shot at this according to the rules, but another rule that we like to implement is that we'll use a die roll to determine how many chances we'll get. Uh, the die we use is this little rectangular die it goes up to four, but you can use a six-sided die if you want. Uh, the reason we do this is because it cuts out a lot of the game time and keeps the game from dragging, uh, because if it turns out if you stick this in a slot, and it's not where the bloodstone is, you're gonna get sent over here to the pit of bones, and then you're gonna to have to go all the way back around and try to get it again. And uh, the sword is gonna go back here in its little slot. Now the deal with the villain is, um, a couple of things. Number one, he's going to be able to block players, so nobody's going to be able to move past them. The villain, however, will be able to pass over other players. Uh, one of the big things is if the villain ends up landing on somebody by exact count, then that player will be able to either steal the sword or steal the bloodstone if that player happens to have it. 
Uh, now we have a house rule with this as well. And the main reason is because um, if I were over here and the player was over here with the bloodstone and the villain landed on him, I could steal it and just simply make my way back to base camp. That seems a little bit cheap to me. So uh, the way we do it is we'll put the bloodstone and the villain back over here uh, where he started. Now, some people, you can also put the bloodstone over there if you would like to. It just depends on how uh, long you want to make the game or how you would like to make the game. Um, so if it turns out that the player can steal the sword, he can just simply steal the sword. Also, if the villain lands on you, that player is going to go ahead and get sent to one of the pit of bones over there on the edge. So anyway, let's go ahead and uh, pretend that I've gotten in here and I'll go ahead and try to uh, figure out where the bloodstone is here. Okay. He's not in here. He's not in here. Oh, there he goes. Okay. I got out the bloodstone. I'll go ahead and place it in front of me like this. And then I'm going to be able to uh, go to uh, one of uh, these sections over here or over here if I would like to and uh, then I'm going to go ahead and try to make my way back to base camp with the stone so this is where it becomes a race and people are going to try to see if they can steal the stone from you so let's say I happen to have the bloodstone and I'm trying to rush back over here and let's say uh, this player lands on me by exact count now according to the rules you'll be able to either steal the stone or the sword from me. But one thing we do is the person who lands on me is going to have to try to roll a four, five, or six on the die in order to steal the stone from me. Uh, if he is able to do that, he'll get the stone. If he rolls a one, two, or three, he will not. And that just makes the game a little more interesting to us. But anyway, there'll be a lot of this back and forth going on, and the first player who is able to successfully get back to base camp with the stone is going to win. Uh, now, you don't have to reach the base camp by exact count, but if you want to make the game more interesting, you can just instill a rule saying you have to make it there by exact count. Uh, that way, it'll give each player a chance to try to steal the stone and get there. So, folks, that is Curse of the Idol. So, my final thoughts on the game Curse of the Idol. Well, this is one of uh, the games that I found out from my friend Matt. It's one of those rare games that you don't really see much anymore, and I don't think it was released in the U.S. I love the way the board looks. Uh, the artwork on the board is really, really beautiful, I think. Really cool looking. The walls, they're fairly okay. I mean, they get a little bit bent when you're trying to uh, set it up, so you just kind of have to uh, work with it a little bit in order to uh, make it look good. Uh, the pieces are fairly decent. Now, the gameplay itself, with the way the rules are written, uh, the game does have some issues, but uh, whenever you implement rule changes, it uh, makes the game decent, I think. Uh, now, I ended up getting this game for about $50, and that's on the low end nowadays. Would I spend, recommend getting this game? If you can get it for uh, cheap, then I would recommend getting it. Uh, definitely not a game for deep gamers. It's more for casual gamers. It is a game that is for ages 8 and up. And um, the, the game is flexible, so you can add some rule changes and just kind of mess around with it to make the game better. Uh, the way we have the rules, uh, we like it. I would not spend more than what I uh, paid for it, for sure. I've seen it go for around $100. I would definitely not pay that much for it. Uh, but, yeah, it's a decent game. If you like uh, these kind of adventure games, the board looks really nice. Uh, the gameplay with the added rules makes it pretty cool. So, guys, that's my review of Curse of the Idol. Catch you later. Keep on gaming.